Hey, how nice to see you all. Thank you very much for joining us tonight for this really special event. Um, it's uh, produced and it's coming to you from Edinburgh Science Festival. It is so sad we can't be there physically. It's the best festival I've ever been to. Such a great celebration of science. Um, but tonight we're coming through uh, a different means. And actually, in a lot of ways, this is really good because we can speak to and reach out to um, an international kind of global audience. So my name is Jules Howard. Um, I'm a presenter, zoology correspondent and author. This event that you are watching is CryoArks, Animal Biobanking for Research and Conservation. It's going to be really, really interesting. I'm really excited. I've been thinking about this for absolutely ages. So... Um, in a second, I'm going to introduce our fab speakers tonight, and I'm also going to um, sort of introduce what biobanks kind of are and what they mean to me. Um, and hopefully those ideas might be shot down by our fantastic speakers tonight. But before we go any further, um, a little bit of housekeeping. OK, uh, four bits of housekeeping. Uh, number one, if you've got any technical um, issues, you can let us know using the Q&A function. So any problems, just give us a shout. And uh, the team that's working on this are unbelievable. So they'll quickly be able to sort you out, I'm sure. Second bit of housekeeping, um, the event is being recorded, uh, but rest assured your camera and microphone are obviously switched off. Um, the event, uh, actually, we've also got live captioning tonight, which is fantastic. So if you want to use the live captioning, you should see a little CC button um, in, the, uh, in the menu below. And there's also, of course, an opportunity to ask questions. And for me, I always think, you know, you know, often these kind of events really come alive with some good questions and we've got quite a lot of time for discussion at the end. So there is no question too dumb. Honestly, sometimes they're the most fantastic questions. So please keep your questions. Well, add them, keep them coming in um, using the uh, obviously the Q&A bar um, as the event progresses. So before I introduce my speakers, um, I uh, for me, I mean, a few years ago, I didn't really know what biobanking was. And I was lucky enough to work with um, a couple of the uh, speakers tonight, actually. And they completely opened my eyes, really, it sort of illuminated me, really, about the potential of uh, biobanking technology. I don't know about you. I, I think my speakers might roll their eyes in a second. But when I used to think about uh, genetics and banking genetics and stuff like that, you know, keeping DNA, I, I immediately thought of, uh, obviously, Dennis Nedry in Jurassic Park. And, you know, the nice freezers and the label saying Tyrannosaurus Rex on it and the, and the you know, liquid nitrogen and all this sort of stuff. And um, speaking to these guys, I quickly realised that actually this is about much more than just theme parks. It's much more than just science fiction. Actually, this is genuinely one of the most exciting areas of um, conservation biology. So our speakers tonight are coming from two different fields. We're talking museums and the applications of biobanks and uh, DNA um, from museum collections. But we're also going to be talking about um, zoo collections as well and how together museums and zoos um, can make the best use of this absolutely awesome uh, resource. So um, the CryoArks biobank, you'll hear a lot about that tonight. Um, this is the first national network of frozen animal material in the UK, so it's really, really exciting. Um, national Museum Scotland and the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland, they're partners in this collaboration. Uh, so tonight we're going to be hearing from um, speakers from those organisations who are just going to, as I say, really illuminate this fascinating uh, topic. So our speakers, on, our, on that note, I should probably say hello to our speakers. Hello, guys. Give me a little wave. Excellent. Hello. <laughs> in my head, there's wild live applause but i know for now those days have to be paused um, but perhaps the people at home around the world are you know applauding into the sky so i should introduce first dr andrew kitchener um, andrew is a principal curator of vertebrate biology at national museum scotland incredible collection i'm sure many of you have been there a collection of 200,000 vertebrates unbelievable so really really awesome to have andrew with us today andrew's going to be talking about the role that museum collections can play in biobanking Hello, Andrew. OK, next up, we've got um, Dr. Jill Murray-Dixon, who is a Biobank Research Fellow. Um, hello, Jill. Hi. Uh, OK, Jill's got a background in conservation genetics and has developed biobanking infrastructure at National um, Museum Scotland and the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland. Jill's going to be telling us all about biobank biobanking, kind of how it works and what it looks like and the kind of day to day um, what this uh, technology, uh, you know, can tell us and, and, and how it's being used. And then finally, we've got Dr. Helen Sen. Hello, Helen. 
give you a little wave. There we go. Hi, hi. <laughs> Helen is uh, head of conservation and science programs at the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland. Um, specialist interest in conservation genetics and works on species conservation strategies internationally. Um, Helen's going to be telling us much more about the practical applications um, and how she's using this um, resource um, actually in zoo collections. So again, really nice spread. Hopefully, I'm sure we're going to be learning absolutely loads about I, something I think we'll be talking about for, for decades, if not centuries. So welcome our speakers. Thanks so much for being here um, tonight. Don't forget, you guys viewing at home, don't forget you can um, ask questions anytime, Q&A, get them in uh, in the Q&A bar, in, in the chat bar, um, and we'll look forward to answering those at the end. So without further ado, um, Andrew's presentation is going to start in a second. I should probably um, warn viewers, some viewers um, might you know, be a little bit uh, sensitive, I suppose, to some of the images. Obviously, they're museum collections, so some of them are uh, dead specimens. There's not, I've seen this presentation, very nice, interesting presentation, um, but you know, you may prefer to uh, not um, watch certain bits. So just to chuck that warning out there, Andrew, can't wait to hear about your research. Hello, I'm Andrew Kitchen. I'm the Principal Curator of Vertebrates at National Museum Scotland. And welcome to the Wolfson Galleries of the Natural World. I'm sure many of you will have visited the museum and seen the spectacular array of animal specimens that we have on display. But for many people, this is all that we have in the museum, such as this spectacular caracal lynx, which is jumping into the air and catching this guinea fowl. But in fact, the specimens that we have on display in our galleries are only a tiny proportion, less than 1% of the specimens we have in our collections. So that most of our specimens, in the case of the vertebrates, at least 200,000 of them are actually behind the scenes and therefore research. So they were never meant for display and are, collect, are kept just for researchers to come and work on from all around the world. And we have lots of different kinds of collections. So we have skins from birds and mammals. So on the left here, we can see some skins of silvery marmosets and black-tailed marmosets. And on the right, we can see some skins of purple-throated chatterers. And of course, these specimens aren't designed to be on display and look spectacular, but they are instead made so that they can fit conveniently in drawers so that they're easy to keep and study. We also have many thousands of vertebrate skeletons. And again, these aren't articulated to look good, um, but they're kept loose in boxes, such as this skeleton of the Duke Langer from Southeast Asia. It's a very rare monkey. And on the right, we have the vertebra from a brown bear, 28 year old brown bear. And you can see these bony growths coming out of the skeleton. And so people aren't just measuring bones, but they're also looking at skeletal diseases such as arthritis. We also have tens of thousands of birds' eggs in the collection. And these are usually laid out in their individual clutches in drawers. And they either have numbers written on them, which we can use to identify them and, and tie them back to data cards, or in this case, they're all individually labeled. We also have wet collections. These are specimens or parts of specimens that are preserved in alcohol, ethanol, or formalin. And on the left here, we can see part of our reptile collection. You see lots of snakes in jars of ethanol. And on the right, we can see some hind feet from a Colobus monkey that lived in Edinburgh Zoo back in 1924. Of course, we have some specimens that are tens of thousands of years old, and we can actually investigate them and find out when they were living in Scotland. So for example, on the right, we have part of the tusk of a woolly mammoth, which was found in Clifton Hall, just outside Edinburgh in the early 1800s. And by radiocarbon dating, we know that this particular mammoth was living just outside Edinburgh about 30,000 years ago. On the left, we can see the skull of a lynx, and this came from caves near Inchna Damp in Sutherland. And from radiocarbon dating, this particular lynx, we know that it was living in Scotland as recently as 1700 years ago. Now, of course, it's very important to know about the history of species, especially extinct species in Scotland, because this forms part of the evidence to decide whether it's possible to reintroduce them or not into the, in the future. 
Of course, we have some interesting new kinds of collections, such as our CryoArx Biobank. This contains many thousands of frozen mussel samples, which are used as a source of uh, genetics for researchers from around the world. And my colleague, Jill Murray Dixon, will be telling you more about that later. We have lots of different important specimens in the collection. And amongst the most important are type specimens. And these are the specimens that were used by researchers when they were describing new species. So on the right, we have the straw-necked ibis, whose scientific name was originally Ibis spinicollis. And it was described by Robert Jemison back in 1835. And so this particular specimen underpins that scientific name, Ibis spinicollis, even though today we call it Threskionis spinicollis. On the left, we have a much more recent type specimen. This is Goodman's mouse lemur, Microcebus lahila itzara, which was actually found as a living animal in Zurich Zoo. It was one of nine specimens that were imported from Madagascar and was only described by a scientist back in 2005. So this is what we call a syntype because it's one of nine specimens that were described at the time. We also have some very old specimens in the collection. Apart from the fossils and the archeological material, the earliest collected specimen was this dried penis of a whale, which was collected by Robert Sibbald back in the 1690s in Orkney. And on the right, we have the skull of a Malayan tapir, which was collected by Sir Stamford Raffles back in the 1820s. In fact, this specimen was originally a taxidermy specimen that was sent to the Marchioness of Hastings in Calcutta, who then sent it on to Edinburgh. Sadly, the taxidermy hasn't survived, but fortunately somebody was clever enough to, change, to save the skull for the collections. Perhaps our most famous specimen is Dolly the sheep, and I'm sure you'll have all seen her in our galleries. She's currently on display in the Animal World Gallery. And we don't just have her taxidermy specimen, but we have a muscle sample for her, from her in our biobank, and we also have her skeleton. And here we can see her shin bones end on, and you can see the tiny bony growths around the joint, which shows that she was suffering from arthritis, probably because she was a bit obese. Another famous uh, specimen which arrived fairly recently is this wildcat, which you can read all about in Gavin Maxwell's Ring of Bright Water. He found it swimming out at sea off the Kyle of Loch Alsh and saved it. And you can read more about how it ended up in Surrey. Perhaps one of our most important collections are our cetaceans, the whales, dolphins, and porpoises. And we have more than 4,000 specimens and this collection is growing strongly. On the left, we have a Blainville's beaked whale. This was stranded in Wales back in 1993 and it was the first record of this species in Britain. On the right, the smaller skull is of a striped dolphin. Now this species was unknown in Scotland until 1988 and since then it has become quite common. And this may indicate that this species has been colonizing Scottish seas um, because of climate change. The larger skull in the image on the right is from a Sauvis beaked whale. This is a species that has become in increasingly stranded in Scotland and there's evidence that some of these animals are dying of decompression sickness having been scared to the surface by naval sonar. Now our collections are used by researchers from all around the world and for one of the most obvious ways the collections are used are in, as measuring things. So um, for example you can see here part of our fox collection of which we have thousands of specimens and researchers measure the skulls and they've been able to look at differences between urban and rural populations of foxes to show how the fox has adapted to a new human environment. We can also use our collections to look at the ecology of these animals over time. These are some skins of a wild cat on the left, a domestic cat on the right, and a hybrid cat in the middle. And we take samples of bone or fur or whisker and we can see how the diets of these animals have changed over time using a technique called stable isotope analysis. And in fact, we've been recently involved in a study which has looked at how the wildcat's diet has changed dramatically during the 20th century. And we're investigating why this is the case. We can also use another technique called collagen fingerprinting to identify species. 
it's very useful for identifying bones from archaeological sites where there are often just fragments of bone left. Recently, we used this technique to identify whalebone from archaeological sites in Scotland. And this particular bone is a vertebra from a grey whale. And this is one of the first records of this extinct species that was found in Scotland. Grey whales today only exist in the Pacific Ocean and they became extinct in the Atlantic about 300 years ago. Our collections are also used in genetic studies, either from bits of skin or bone from particular specimens or from muscle samples in our biobank. And this example is uh, a small loris called the Anguantibo, which is found in West Central Africa, and it's closely related to bush babies. And this particular specimen came to Edinburgh Zoo in 1965 and sadly died in 1966. And it stayed in our freezers until 1997 when we prepared it as the skin and also a skeleton. It's featured recently in a big international study which looked at how susceptible bush babies, lorises and lemurs are to COVID-19. Fortunately, the study found that anguantibos and other lorises and bush babies aren't very susceptible but sadly the lemurs are. Another use of our collections is in animal welfare. On the left you can see a tiger climbing a telegraph pole in order to get the meat at the top. This is a behavioural enrichment which simulates the hunting behaviour of tigers. It not only makes tigers very fit but it's very good for their mental well-being. And we compared the skeletons of tigers that climb a feeding pole with those that don't. And we also found that they suffer far fewer bone diseases than the animals that don't. On the right, we can see some rather curved bones. These are the limb bones of a stump-tailed macaque. And the curving of these bones shows that this animal is suffering from rickets, which means that it didn't get enough calcium in its diet during the development of the skeleton and the bones have bent under its weight. So we can investigate not only the behavior of tigers, for example, but also the effects of different kinds of diet on animals living in zoos. And then we can get some very unexpected uses of collections. I'm sure you'll have seen this jaguar wandering through a hotel lobby in either TV or cinema adverts, but in fact it doesn't exist, it's completely computer generated. But the very detailed fur and markings on that fur that you can see in this jaguar is based on a specimen in the museum's collection. Thank you, Andrew. That was absolutely fascinating. And it's just so nice as well to see the specimens um, at the museum. I miss it so much. I can't wait to go back there. Um, but yeah, no, thanks ever so much for that. So I just had a couple of quick questions, if this is okay now. Um, you are obviously uh, in charge of vertebrates. For invertebrates, do a lot of the same um, opportunities, there's there still the same opportunities in invertebrates compared to vertebrates to, as you say, inform all of this amazing science? Well, yes, of course, our, our invertebrate collections are even bigger. I mean, there are literally millions of specimens in those and they come from all kinds of habitats, uh, both in Scotland and all around the world. So there's huge potential there for doing all kinds of research. And, and likewise, researchers are coming from all around the world to look at those collections. And sampling, I'm just imagining, uh, I don't know, sampling of, of, of a small species of fly or something like that and taking its DNA. Is it the same, is it a similar process to what it would be with, um, you know, Dolly the sheep or, you know, something more meaty? <laughs> Yeah, um, it, well, instead of, you know, a small muscle sample, often a, a leg has to be sacrificed in order to get enough uh, material for DNA to be extracted. But yeah, the principle is the same. Yeah, oh, fascinating. OK, cool. Well, well, I'm sure there'll be more questions um, later on in our little chat. You guys at home, don't forget, there's the Q&A bar. So please do put your questions in there. Um, definitely would absolutely love to hear from you. So thank you very much to those um, who have done so already. OK, Andrew, we're going to come back to you um, okay. in a short while. But uh, next of all, our next speaker is Biobank Research Fellow, uh, Dr. Jill Murray-Dixon. Um, as I said before, Jill's got a, a background in conservation genetics and has been developing the biobanking infrastructure at National Museum Scotland and the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland, which are the Scottish kind of storage hubs, if you like, of the cryoarchs um, network. Uh, so, you know, Jill, take it away. Um, oh, just quickly, you guys at home, 
there are again a couple of images here that some people might be sensitive to so yeah please feel free obviously you know to turn away at those moments um, or just listen to the audio so jill take it away thanks jill and hello everyone uh, my name is jill marie dixon and i'm the biobank research fellow at the national museums of scotland and the royal zoological society of scotland here in edinburgh and I'm briefly going to introduce you to the world of biobanking and show you some of our biobank facilities in Edinburgh. So a biobank is a little bit like a library. It's a specialist storage facility which stores very large numbers of samples uh, along with their data in a well-organized manner. And this is so that each sample is not only carefully stored uh, but it's also so it can be easily retrieved when it's needed. Now, when you hear the word biobank, uh, there are a few that might spring to mind, such as the Svalbard Global Seed Vault in Norway uh, or the Millennium Seed Bank in London. You might also have heard about the human um, sample biobanks, and there's one of these in the UK and another one in Denmark. These are all very large centralised storage um, facilities that hold botanical samples and the latter provide a resource for uh, biomedical research. Now, in comparison, zoological biobanks are relatively west, less well known and they're often thought to be um, less well established. However, there are a few large facilities around the world uh, and probably the, the, the most well known is the cryogenic collection at uh, the Frozen Zoo at San Diego's Zoo's Institute for Conservation Research. But as Andrew has mentioned, uh, many museums and other organisations have also been collecting and preserving animal samples for a very long time, and um, they just weren't always organised as an official biobank. So in the UK, uh, the, the CryoArks Biobank Initiative um, has been established to try and link up collections of frozen zoological samples, um, but they're held both across museums, zoos, uh, research institutions and existing biobanks. Now, the aim is to both increase the, the size of the zoological sample collections uh, and also bring together the sample data um, so that both are more easily accessible to researchers. And we also provide guidance and advice to others who manage their own frozen collections. The National Museum's Collection Centre and Edinburgh Zoo um, are both storage hubs um, for the CryoArks Initiative. Um, and Edinburgh Zoo is also one of four hosts of the European Association of Zoos and Aquaria Biobank Collection, which contains samples from zoo and aquaria animals. Now, the samples that are held in a biobank facility um, can range from DNA to blood and tissue to cell lines and gametes. And the type of storage will often dictate the type of facilities that are then needed. Most samples are held between minus 80 degrees Celsius and minus 196, and, and that's in liquid nitrogen. So to put this in context, your household freezer sits at about minus 20 degrees, um, and the penguins in the Antarctic, they live at about 100, um, 100 minus 50 degrees, I think. Uh, storing samples at these temperatures um, helps to preserve the genetic material, and that's either by reducing enzymatic activity uh, or when they're snap frozen in liquid nitrogen, it stops all biological processes, which prevents deterioration. Now, in case you're thinking about where you store your fish fingers, I'd like to take you over to the uh, National Museum Collection Centre in Granton, Edinburgh, to show you what our biobank looks like. Here we have a cold storage facility dedicated to archiving samples um, that are collected from the zoo and wild animal specimens that are in our museum research collection. We mostly store um, blood and tissue samples um, such as muscle or parts of internal organs um, and we store our samples at minus 80 degrees. Now these samples are either collected from live animals during uh, routine checkups or when an animal dies during a post-mortem or during museum preparation. Now to buy a bank a sample, uh, each of the samples are cut up into very small pieces. This is so that we can separate the sample up and store it across um, several small tubes. And this both helps us to um, maximize the efficiency of the storage 
so that we can fit more samples into our freezers. Um, but it also ensures that we have a backup for each of those samples that we can keep in a different location. And this is really important in case something happens to one of those samples. Uh, each sample is put into a tube and each tube has a barcode on it. Um, and a little bit like our DNA is unique to us, the barcode is unique to that sample. And it's on the tube as both a, a linear barcode and a two dimensional, as long as well as a, a human readable version. And that's just in case our, our technology fails us. Uh, each individual barcode is scanned into a database um, where we hold um, lots of information, both about the animal that the sample was collected from, um, but also just how that sample is stored and also when it's used and when it runs out. Now, each of our low temperature freezers can store up to about 40,000 sample tubes. Um, and at the moment, we have over a thousand species represented in the collection. With so many sample tubes, it's really important that we have a, a good way that we can locate each and every one of them efficiently. So we also use um, barcoded racks of tube racks, and these are kept in a series of freezer racks and drawers. And that really allows us to access each and every sample and when we need it efficiently. If you like, in, in many ways, you can think about the biobank storage system. It's a little bit like branches of a tree or, or an evolutionary tree, um, where each tube is a leaf or a tip that, that belongs to a branch or a box and so on. Now, to maintain the quality of the genetic material contained in each sample, we try to make sure that the temperatures they're stored at are kept as consistent as possible. Large variations in the temperature can cause a sample to deteriorate over time. Uh, not only that, but as you can imagine, it's a big job to defrost these freezers, so we, we try to prevent the unnecessary buildup of ice. We don't want to open them too often. And we make sure that these temperatures are, um, are kept and monitored very closely, um, and we have a series of monitors and alarms which, which keep track of those freezer temperatures around the clock. Uh, if any of them fail, and by that I mean if the temperatures go above about minus 70 degrees, uh, we need to relocate those samples as quickly as possible. We also keep a close eye on the room temperature that the freezer is stored in, because if the room is too warm, the freezers um, overwork, um, and this can also cause a problem if they fail. So unlike a lot of other specimens in our museum collection, such as these very large whale skeletons, our biobank samples are usually very small and each time they're used, we lose a little bit of that sample. So each is a very finite resource. This means that we not only try to store them to preserve the genetic content, but we want to make sure that they're used carefully so that they're not only available now, but also for researchers far into the future. The samples that we hold in our biobank cover both wide geographical and temporal scales, and they are an invaluable resource for researchers wanting to study DNA. DNA is extracted from each of the samples, uh, first by breaking down the tissue, and that's to maximize the surface area. And next, the cells are burst open using a surfactant to break the lipid membranes. And that's a little bit the same as the way in which washing up liquid breaks down grease. We add salt uh, and that helps the DNA clump together and then we wash it with ethanol which helps us to isolate the DNA contained. Now in the lab we use specialist kits to do this because these samples are very small and often very difficult to get DNA from um, but you can actually find the instructions online on how to extract DNA from a strawberry uh, and the process is largely similar and it's, it's well worth a try at home. Now each person's DNA or animal's DNA is unique to themselves. And because of this, it's the similarities and the differences between those sequences uh, that make genetic data so useful for comparing uh, individual populations, species, and even whole ecosystems. Uh, the data can be used to manage captive populations, uh, wild populations. They can be used to help develop tools to fight illegal wildlife trade. Uh, examine relationships between individuals, um, and even find out what it's had for its dinner. But as well as understanding um, how the DNA in our biobank samples are used at the moment, it's also really important to understand what we're not trying to do just now. We are not trying to recreate Jurassic Park. Uh, whilst the idea of bringing back dinosaurs and maybe a few mammoths might seem very exciting, um, the idea of bringing back a species from extinction is a far bigger than simply preserving the samples correctly. 
there's a minefield of considerations uh, to take into account when considering this. Um, for example, if you did bring back a mammoth, where would you put it? So my colleague Helen now is going to tell you a little bit more about um, how scientists and researchers today are using biobank samples to help tackle some really important conservation issues. It's becoming increasingly difficult for researchers to collect and transport samples from wild populations. So the biobank provides an essential tool that help researchers do their job. And if you like, we're providing some really tiny tools um, that hopefully help solve some really big problems. Thank you very much. Thanks ever so much for that, Jill. Uh, fantastic. Like, I've covered so much. It was really nicely done. And it's great to see inside um, the lab as well. It was just, that was the cleanest freezer I've ever seen in my life. Does everyone say that? Uh, I don't know many people have seen inside them, to be honest, but I would hope that that's what they would say. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. So just uh, there was one thing there. obviously you, you, you quite rightly made the point that, you know, this isn't about necessarily bringing back dinosaurs or bringing back mammoths and the complications surrounding that issue, which I'm about to park. But in, in Jurassic Park, you're used to this, OK, when I just bring up Jurassic Park. But in Jurassic Park, we, we hear from Mr. DNA, don't we? And uh, they're collecting up those big strands of DNA. And in the film, uh, some of those bits of DNA go, they're missing and they fill them in with, fro I don't know, frog DNA or something like that. So when you're working away on your samples, you are each time, are you getting like the whole strand? Like, you know, it, 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 or are some bits damaged and you're collecting multiple strands to fill in the gaps? Like, how does that, how does that sort of work? Yeah, so it's, so we talk about DNA quality a lot and we talk about quality of samples and this is really to try and preserve these sort of long strands of DNA that already exist in the sample. Now DNA sort of does start breaking down both over time but also when, the, when it's not stored correctly and ultimately the more that breaks down the more you have to do a little bit of guesswork to try and start piecing things together. It's a little bit like having a jigsaw puzzle and you know having all the bits kind of separated now, if you've got other species that have similar DNA sequences, you can use that to match them against, a bit like having the cover of a cardboard box for your jigsaw puzzle to look at so you know what you're looking for. But without that, and the older it gets, the more difficult it gets. Yeah, okay, fascinating. Okay, that, that's great. Okay, well, I'm sure there'll be much, much more talk, um, you know, in the Q&As. Don't forget, you guys at home, you know, the Q&A bias there is waiting for you. Please do ask your questions. We've had some fantastic ones coming in. I can't wait to get to them. But first, we are going to move now on to our final speaker for the night, uh, which is Dr. Helen Sen. Are you there, Helen? Give me a little wave. OK, <laughs> so Helen um, Helen is head of conservation and science programmes at the Royal Zoo Zoological Society of Scotland, um, a specialist in conservation genetics, uh, works on species conservation strategies internationally. So much to say. I'm so, I, I can't wait to hear more about this. So Helen, you know, go for it. Take it away. Hi, my name is Helen Sen. I'm Head of Conservation and Science Programmes at the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland, and we are host to the RZSS Biobank, which is on site at Edinburgh Zoo, and it has samples from zoo animals, both from our zoos, Edinburgh Zoo and Holland Wildlife Park, and also from zoo animals all around the world, and from animals um, all around the world in the wild, and we use these samples to help conservation of species in the wild and that's what I'm going to be talking about and there's a whole way of different there's a whole variety of different ways that we can do that um, and I'm going to give a few examples from around the world so we work on all of these different species all across the world I'm going to focus on three specific examples um, and just hone in a little bit how these um, biobank samples um, are helping us with conservation of these species that are on the brink of extinction. So the first place we're going to go to is the Wade Rimi Wade Achim Nature Reserve in Chad and this is a scimitar horned oryx. Scimitar horned oryx went extinct in the wild in the 1980s and this oryx here with its collar on and the little baby beside it are some of the first um, of their species to be reintroduced back to the wild just a few years ago and biobank samples and genetic analysis of those samples has really helped with this project. So there's there's no, no none of the species left in the wild officially apart from the reintroduced animals but there's actually many thousands of those animals in captivity and these over 20,000 animals were have descended from just a really small number of animals that were taken into captivity originally to be part of this rescue program just 44 global founders and one of the really important jobs 
of managing this reintroduction is to make sure that we choose the best animals to put back into the wild to make sure we have a broad range of genetic diversity um, and that's really where biobanking has been helping us so we've got samples of this species from all around the world and we've then used genetic profiling um, analysis of the mitochondrial dna in order to look at the different genetic types or genotypes um, found within this global population and this has helped us to make an assessment of what the best animals are to choose to put back as part of this reintroduction. And the best choices really involve choosing uh, lots and lots of different types of genetic types. Each, each type on this graph is a different color. Uh, each genotype on this graph is a different color. And so that uh, choosing a, a multicolored um, range of animals to put back into the wild helps um, improve genetic diversity. And what that does is it helps improve resilience to different threats and challenges that that population might face. So they might face disease or they might face um, climate change in the future and having high levels of genetic diversity will help that population be resilient and evolve and adapt to those challenges in the future. The next place we're going to is the Cairngorm National Park in Scotland and to the Scottish wildcat, which is another species which is on the brink of extinction. So there's probably fewer than 115 uh, wildcats left in the wild. It's very difficult to get estimates on this elusive species, um, but that's our, our best guess. Um, there's actually quite a few in captivity now, around 150 in 30 different zoos and other collections across the United Kingdom. And so we've been working really hard on trying to understand the best way forwards for the conservation of this species. And part of that um, puzzle has involved using genetic analysis of biobank samples to try and help us understand a few different things. The first is to really improve how we manage captive breeding, because captive breeding is clearly going to be a really important part of the recovery for this species. So we've used samples from all of the wildcats that are found in captivity to try and reconstruct the relatedness of all of the individuals in captivity and to use that to better manage breeding decisions within their conservation breeding program. And that involves um, making sure that we're minimizing the levels of inbreeding, minimizing uh, any chance that we might um, uh, choose related individuals for mating. And so that's a really um, been a really important part of the biobanking effort and lots and lots of um, work has gone into uh, sampling all, that, all of the animals from across the breeding program. Another really important thing um, that we've done, and we've done this very much in collaboration with the National Museums of Scotland, has been looking at the genetics of wildcats all across Scotland. So historical samples found in the museum, roadkill samples, samples that are being collected by um, field biologists and ecologists to try and understand as much as possible as we can about this species that's on the brink of extinction. And one of the things that um, genetic analysis has been able to help us with has been understanding the threat of hybridization. So wildcats crossbreed or interbreed with their closest related, uh, one of their closest relatives, which is the domestic cat. And genetic analysis can really help us understand how to sort out what's a wildcat and what's a hybrid. And that's something that we've been doing um, in close collaboration with the National Museum of Scotland for a number of years now. Um, and hoping that um, by using uh, biobank samples from museums and from zoos and from uh, all sorts of field projects, um, really trying to put together a comprehensive picture of what's going on. So the third and final place we're going to is the Chitwan National Park in Nepal. And this is home of the tiger. And tigers, uh, some of the last um, remaining populations in tiger, of tigers in Nepal are coming into a lot of conflict with human communities that live in and around the forest edge. Um, and we've been using biobank samples to try and help us understand this conflict, working closely with a team of scientists at the Centre of Molecular Dynamics in Kathmandu in Nepal, um, and really trying to use um, biobank samples and genetic analysis to try and resolve some of this conflict. So how do you do that? Well, tigers that 
eat um, a whole variety of different things. And one of the things that brings them into conflict with people is actually eating um, domestic animals. So things like domestic buffalo or even dogs and pigs. And one of the ways of trying to understand how to resolve human wildlife conflict is trying to understand a little bit more uh, what tigers are eating and, and how, how perhaps to change um, human behavior, human agricultural practices in order to reduce the levels of conflict. And so one really technical part of that is really understanding in detail what individual tigers are eating. And in order to do that, you can take tiger scats and run something called DNA beta barcoding, where you sequence every single species that, that's found in that scat, every single species that the tiger has eaten. And you can then use that to understand what's on the tiger's menu. And one of the reasons why biobank samples have been really important in this process is because you need to have references for that menu. You need to be able to understand when you do the sequencing of the tiger scat, what you're actually looking at. And biobanks are really good places for holding reference samples of many, many different species. So we run the analysis of the tiger scat and then we look against our samples in the biobank to see what the tiger's been eating. The other thing that we've been doing with our um, our tigers at the zoo is we've also been testing these methods because of course we can, we know at the zoo what our tigers are eating and so we can test what's gone in and what's come out uh, using these DNA bar barcoding methods before we then uh, take it out to the wild. So this is just an example of how using biobank samples from lots of different species is helping us to understand what's on the tiger's menu and reducing, hopefully allowing us to reduce uh, conflict between humans and tiger populations in Nepal. So that was the last of three examples of how biobank zoo samples are helping us with conservation in the wild. Thanks so much for listening and I'll hand you back to Jules now. Thanks loads for that, uh, Helen. That was absolutely fascinating. I knew it would be. Uh, I can't wait to get back to the zoo as well um, really soon. Um, do you know, I had a quick question. We're going to go to the Q&A in a second. We're going to get all of your faces there together. But before we do that, I just wondered, um, you know, so we started, I don't know, sequencing genomes in uh, the mid 90s, say. I don't know, it might have been a bit later. Did you, or do you think the zoo community saw, did you see this coming? Has it moved at the speed you imagined it to move, this sort of technology, or has it been faster, or has it been a bit kind of slower? What do you reckon? I think it's been really rapid. Um, I mean, I've been working um, at OZSS for 10 years now, and before that, um, I was probably another five or six years working as a geneticist, and... Um, it's almost unrecognisable, the methods that I used during my PhD to what we use now. And, and the cost as well of whole genome sequencing has come down. Um, and one of the, the really key things is the computing power that we need to crunch all that data because it produces so much information and we have to use bigger and bigger supercomputers in order to do that. So how long would it, to, how long would it take to crunch, you know, I don't know, a, a tape here or something like that? You know, how long would that process take? Well, I mean, it depends. It depends, obviously, on the size of your computing power, but it's not just that. It's having the skilled people, the bioinformaticians um, who can use um, the tools, computer programming tools um, uh, to, to really mine that data and find the useful things in them. So at the lab here, we have um, a number of people who are very specialised bioinformaticians in, in, in getting um, valuable information for conservation out of this kind of very technical whole genome data. So perhaps not what people would normally associate with being a conservation biologist. Yeah, cool, okay, lovely. Thank you again for that. Thanks a lot to all of our speakers uh, today. Thank you ever so much, guys. So we're gonna move on to the Q&A. If you are watching this, if you've got any questions at all, please do put them in now and we'll do our best to, um, to get to them. So do you know what? I reckon let's just dive in here with some questions that we've had um, coming in. So, um, uh, this is, I think this is probably best for Andrew, but obviously you guys should feel free to jump in. You know how it works, obviously. Okay, this is from Rachel. Thanks ever so much, Rachel, for your uh, question here. So what kind of specimen would yield the best DNA, i.e. wet versus dry store, or is it only frozen tissue that is worth working with? 
Well, you can potentially get DNA from all of those, but um, I think the others would be better to answer this. But my my opinion is it's the, the frozen stuff is best and then the dry stuff and then the wet stuff. But um, maybe Helen or Jill has, have another view on that. I can say I can chip in there, having worked with a massive range throughout my career, right? Everything from a tanned skin from a python uh, all the way up to some really freshly plucked muscle tissue, so to speak. And ultimately, yeah, we can get DNA out of all of them, but it's, as I said, it's this sort of, keep going on about the quality of the DNA. It's these long strands and um, if they're preserved nicely. Um, so wet collections, we often think about things stored in formalin. Formalin is just not good for getting stuff out of DNA. If you're taking a blood sample, there's a definitely a way we want that stored versus other ways that just, again, damages the DNA or actually just stops us being able to get the DNA out of the sample easily. And um, what's, so, what's so good about, like you mentioned muscle a few times, what's so good about muscle for extracting DNA? Muscle's just, it's a nice, I would say easy to get sample compared to if they're doing a post-mortem, it's the one that's as easy to get. Um, but any, any biological tissue that's in there, so it could be heart tissue or an organ tissue as well. So we can get that. And the muscles just tend to be the one that's easiest to, to sample, muscles and blood. And this and this is that sort of leads on to another thing that I thought in a couple of your presentations today is that particularly for the historical collections you've had um, in fact all the tapirs the Malayan tapir you said was collected mm -hmm. Andrew in uh, you know was it the 17th century 18th century well it came into the museum about 1820 1821 or something like that and yeah. you've mentioned it had gone through taxidermy and stuff so you know what's the risk that you end up getting I don't know the taxidermist DNA on it you know is that a, is that a risk in any of your I've never heard of that happening. Uh, uh, you know, when people come and sample the specimens, the dry specimens, they 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 make me wince and and feel rather anxious as they try and um, carve huge chunks off it, and I have to kind of fend them off a bit. So it's it's basically a negotiation to try and get the minimum bit that they're going to hack away at, which is why I we, we kind of started our biobank very accidentally about 30 years ago because these uh, ravening hordes of researchers were chopping and slashing away. And I thought, well, if we if we get a bit of sacrificial muscle and put it on one side, then they can have a go at that in, instead. And that's kind of how our biobank evolved. It was a pure accident. We didn't know we were creating a biobank. We hadn't even heard the term before. Uh, but that's why we've built up these sort of uh, thousands of samples over the years. Yeah, fantastic. OK, thank you very much, guys. Um, Helen, I'm going to send one your way. And it sort of links to a question, a really nice question we've had from Rona. Um, and Rona, I'm going to come back to your question here, but I'm going to just change the focus slightly more just to get Helen's perspective. Um, Rona says, if you have thousands of skulls, do you still seek more? You know, how many will be enough? But I'm going to change the word skull for scat. So with tiger scat, for instance, you know, are you literally with tigers? Obviously, there's quite a, you know, a, a considerable global focus on, on that species. Are you sampling like every opportunity you get? Like, how does it work? So I think, um, I mean, one of the things to say about species that are rare in the wild is that it's often very hard to get samples. And so that's a real value for of the biobank, because often we might be trying to develop a method, um, say, for example, for a species like pygmy hippo that we want to apply in the wild in, in Liberia, but actually we don't have any reference material at all. Um, and so going to a biobank or using a zoo sample, a, a sample from a zoo animal can be really useful to, to get you started on that initial piece of work that you'll then apply for, for to the wild. So, I mean, generally speaking, yes, if we can get access to, um, samples of species um you know animals that have died for example roadkill um we would always try and biobank them i think probably um the philosophy between the the the, the zoo biobank and the museum is probably slightly different on that front i'm sure andrew would say he will take you know he would be keen to take take most samples um we are perhaps focusing our projects more on uh, specific questions um relating to the conservation of certain species and so sometimes we do yes we do say that's enough tiger scat now because we don't have space anymore or we don't have we don't have the money to analyze them <laughs> <laughs> okay that's great and just really quickly andrew i'm going to come back to you in a second but you know you showed us all those um fox skulls there mm -hmm. and i know i mean I, funny enough i happened to i happened upon that amazing research project quite recently are you maxed out on fox skulls <laughs> no 
Do you um, always have space for well, more? If you, well, if you imagine, say we've got a thousand fox skulls and well, half of them are male, half of them are female. So already you've dropped to 500. And then you start looking at maybe skulls in Scotland versus England versus Wales. And then it drops down further. And then you want to look more regionally than that. And soon enough, you find that you don't have enough fox skulls for a particular re region. Also, um, as with the, the urban rural fox, you want to look at those changes over time. So we need to have a good spread of time, you know, going back 50, 60, 100 years in order that we can see those changes. So we're continually collecting to reflect the current environment so that in the future, researchers can look back and they will have something to look at, both to measure and also to sample for DNA. Fantastic. OK, thanks for that. that, that that's really helpful, actually. Um, OK, uh, so I've got a question. I think this is probably best for you, Jill. Um, see what you think. Um, are the samples edited in any way or are they carried over exactly. For example, um, you know, obviously one of the big diseases is chytridiomycosis in frogs. You know, if you are sampling a frog that's suffering from that condition, is there a risk you would be taking the DNA of the disease that it's suffering with? So, you know, does that make sense? Absolutely, yeah. And I mean, it, it's all part of, um, I guess, the bit of the animal that we take. We, we have to accept that any sample coming into a biobank if it's something which, for example, exists in the blood of an animal or in the tissues of an animal, then absolutely we're gonna get that DNA across as well. Um, depending on where the animal has come from, we might know more or less if it's been contaminated. Mm -hmm. So we would log all of that information in the database. So if it's come from an animal that we know has been carrying a certain pathogen, we would log that in the database. And that's also to make other people who want to use it aware. So simply from a health and safety point of view, we need to, to be careful about obviously what we're doing. But there's absolutely the chance that you could get both DNA when you're extracting it. You would just hope that most of the DNA you're getting is from the species that you're actually looking for. So it's, it's proportional. It's very small amounts hopefully going to be in there. Um, yeah. Yeah. OK, that's great. Thank you. Um, and then uh, this is from Rebecca. Rebecca, thanks ever so much for your question. Um, what level of collaboration do you request of researchers using biobank samples? Um, and is the data widely available for use? So how does that process work? If someone's at home, if a scientist at home are very keen to contribute or, you know, do research on some of the stuff you've been talking about, how easy is it to do that? Well, it's very easy. Um, <laughs> you can make an online application to CryoArks in order to access the samples in the biobank. Uh, and then, you know, we, we review all of these applications and we try our hardest to approve all of them because we're very keen to encourage research on the biobank specimens. So, uh, yeah, they're accessible and we want people to, to apply to use them. Helen, Jill, do you want to add anything there? Yeah, I was going to say, actually, it's also kind of really the driving force of CryoArks is to try and bring people together to sort of make mm -hmm. their sample collections visible so that we know what's there. Because I'm sure there's loads of collections sort of like lurking away in people's freezers and we just don't know what they are. So it's about finding out what's there and sort of making them accessible. And I think was, I mean, I, as you should, I go on a lot about muscle samples and that's because that's I deal a lot with vertebrate tissues. Um, but there's actually we, one of our partners down um, the Natural History Museum in London have huge collections of invertebrates as well. So between us, we, we cover kind of like a massive range of taxa. So we're always really interested if people have frozen collections that they want to sort of make them known to cryoarchs, it's, you know, bring the data to us. We, we want to know about them. <laughs> and is the ultimate aim here, I mean, is the, not, not perhaps the aim's the wrong word, is the ultimate vision here that every single species that scientists have given a Latin name to, we have their DNA? Probably fair to say, and, and not just one, but as many, uh, we want representative as a population. So that, that's really important as well. And um, so we, we never advocate collecting samples specifically for biobanking, because that means that you're collecting for research. And there's a whole load of sort of licensing and research permits that need to go alongside that. So what we usually do is just suggest that if people are, for example, vets are taking samples during routine screening, that they just, whatever's left over, they pass that on to us. Or as I said, during post-mortems, um, roadkill, anything really, um, if they can collect samples like that, then the more we get those, we just build up, build up, build up. And we, we, yeah, the aim is to try and get as many species covered as possible. Cool. Yeah. Think, uh, Helen, go on. Do you want to go in? No, I was just going to say, I think the power of the biobank samples really will come into force as collect different collections come together. So often 
in genetics we need to know say for example we want to know about um, whether or not there's enough genetic diversity left in Scottish wildcats we might need to know about how we benchmark that against the genetic diversity that's left in other wildcat populations across across Europe and in order to do that you need to have access to samples from from all across the wildcats range and so that's really where biobanks could be very powerful because they will allow researchers to collaborate uh, a lot more easily and effectively. Okay lovely and well while, while you're on Helen um Peter's got a question here it says um do we have DNA analysis for every animal in the zoo? No, we don't. Um, it's actually really surprising that there's a lot of animals, even even you know quite fluffy mammals, cuddly mammals, that we don't have really any genetic information for at all. So we've recently um, done some of the first ever um, genetic analysis on two um, Arabian ungulate species, um, the Nubian ibex and, and the Arabian tar. And uh, we also did some of the first ever genomic analysis on pygmy hippos and they're, they're mammals. Um, I mean, if we start to think about insects and amphibians um, and, and other species, there's, there's millions that haven't been analyzed from a genetic perspective yet. So of course, um, having a sample is, is, the real, is the starting point to then be able to go and do some of that, that deeper analysis. And certainly, you know, we might have one genome from an individual, or one genetic um, sequence, but we often don't have any population level information at all. Um, and so biobanking is looking at that as well as just one, finding one sample individual per species. Yeah, and I think that's where that's that's the mistake I made with biobanking. I imagined it as just a library where you've got one book of everything, and actually, it's so it's a super library, you know. Um, okay, that's fantastic. Okay, I reckon we've got time for two more questions. This one, I don't want us to. Uh, this is this is one of those questions that it can easily sort of sweep us away in a different direction. And we're talking about the conservation of existing species here. Um, but it's it's a great question. We need to ask it. And um, thank you, Nicholas, for this question. Theoretically speaking, will it be possible to bring extinct species back to life someday? And yeah. then also the sub question about what about ethically speaking? But I, I, do you know what? I reckon that that's the ethically speaking question. Let's do that as an event next year because it's such a great question. But I know we're just going to be talking for ages. But, you know, do you think the work you're doing, can you see that being applied to bringing back extinct animals? So, I mean, that's that's not really um, the purpose of the the biobanking project that we're working on at the moment. It's it's more focused on the conservation of animals that are that are on the brink of extinction and and, and also supporting scientific research. Um, I think, you know, we've we've talked about how quickly genetic technology is um, is progressing. And we've I think recently there was um, some really interesting cloning work that was done on the black footed ferret. Um, and I think, you know, we, I'm sure there will be a time when um, we see um, species that have been extinct come back. Um, I think the question is, you know, we've got lots of species that are on the brink of extinction and the problems that they face are things like habitat loss, climate change, um, you know, disease, um, uh, illegal uh, trade in you know, poaching, um, unsustainable um, take. And those for us to re-establish a population in the wild, um, we have to really address those threats. So um, bringing back a species, you know, like mammoth um, from from extinction would just be one part of the step of, you know, re-establishing a healthy mammoth population, for example. So we're working on a lot of species that are on the brink of extinction and trying to reintroduce them. Um, and we're often using genetics to try and understand that. So for example, the Scimitar hondorix, which is on a, a large antelope that's on the brink of extinction in, in North Africa. Um, yeah, yeah. But it's actually working on all those other problems, you know, climate change and, and yeah. com human conflict and things like that, that, that's the real challenge there. Neil, Andrew, I'm looking at you guys and I'm looking for little nods. You know, do you have anything? I've not left you much time here, but you know, Next 25 years, is this going to be a reality, Jill? I would say that, as Helen said, tech, the way technology is moving, uh, never say never. It wouldn't surprise me. But I think it's about just because we can as we should. So that, that airs into the ethical side of it. So I think we might be able to, but whether we will or not is another matter. Yeah. And why make it difficult for ourselves? Let's stop the animals from becoming extinct in the first place so we don't have to waste our time doing that. I mean, it's just crazy. And I sort of sense your frustration there. And I've seen this in you before, you know, you guys before. 
Um, is that because most people just make that immediate leap when they hear about DNA? Jurassic Park, as it's done to me, it sort of, you know, changed the debate a little bit. Are you sort of frustrated by that or do you see it as just this is a great hook? Jurassic Park is a great hook to get people involved in. I think it's I think it is and I think ultimately you know sometimes when you talk about DNA you can you can some people just switch off because you know, they think it's quite a dry subject but actually it's really really interesting when you really get into it and it's the applications that make it so interesting I think so you know to me actually if people are interested in that let's let's talk about it um you know I think actually opening that conversation up is great as long as we can do a little bit of I guess sort of myth busting and fact checking on the way to, to keep it keep it real <laughs> um yeah. but I think that's what's important is just engaging people in the conversation so yeah. cool okay Nicholas thanks ever so much for that question great question like I say maybe we'll take an element of that and then we'll tackle that in a big one next year um closing question uh okay here we go uh, this is to you all, I think. Um, as a current zoology student at university who thought she wanted to work in the field but now has realised her passion for genetics, how would you recommend getting into this field? So zoologist wants to move to genetics. There's two of us. So I'm in there as well now. What advice would you give? Is it an easy switch? This is to all of you. So feel free to chime in. I studied zoology and I sort of, I sort of, yeah, I did my, my, PhD in population genetics and I then was lucky enough to get a job at Edinburgh Zoo kind of working on some of the projects that Helen's previously talked about. So I think as a zoology student I think getting some lab work experience is really really valuable um, and but it's not a hard transition to make I don't think. We're, I think people are crying out for, for people to actually do this sort of work. So, I don't know Helen you, you probably speak to more students than, than I do at the moment. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think I think like I highlighted, um, you know, a great skill to have um, as a as a biologist or conservation biologist are those numerical skills and 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 the the the, the kind of data management side of things because um, you know genetic data is 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 so vast um, and it's it's very useful to to have to to, to bring those skills to a team. So I, I'd really recommend anyone who's who's studying zoology or thinking about studying zoology that you also think about um, making sure you you swat up on and and take the courses on on data analysis and and statistics and and GIS and all these kind of um, big data um, platforms that that are so useful um, for for ongoing research. Okay, cool. Andrew, did you want to add anything there? Yeah, I was just going to say, it's no point in asking me. I just look in awe at these beautiful coloured diagrams you see in these genetics papers and just think how wonderful they are. So, But I think that's that's one of the reasons for me. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I think it's so great is that you, you're pulling on all of these different threads. And I imagine I, I'm making a judgment here, Andrew, so excuse me if I am. But, you know, 100, 150 years ago, I imagine you would have pretty much been working in your, you know, your silo and speaking to other you know experts in your profession but not really necessarily mixing the sciences in quite the same way so I think the collaborative side of this um, is is the best thing about it actually it's really really exciting yeah I think that's it is exciting because you, you might have a specimen in a museum but now you can look at its genetics you can look at its uh, phylogeny you can look at its population genetics you can look at its ecology in terms of its diet through different um, techniques of sampling and so on and so what the stories that those individual specimens can tell are very various now that we there's not just one thing it's a dead animal or in a in a box or in in a shelf it's it's all these other aspects that we can now bring out with different techniques fantastic guys thank you so much it's been it's been genuinely absolutely really fascinating um hearing from you all hearing how the project's going and i would love and i'm sure the viewers at home would love to hear how this progresses because um uh, it's just so great you made so much time really for for um telling everyone about this you know this, this amazing uh, science this amazing research so uh round of applause i guess for our speakers at home i know you're not doing it i'm watching you um thank you very much uh to you guys for coming along today um i've got a few other little notes here before we finish don't go just yet um the zoo is now open again very exciting so edinburgh zoo and highland wildlife park have reopened uh, running events throughout edinburgh science festival including this sounds fantastic a free online um panel event tomorrow celebrating women in conservation which sounds fantastic and the information about that is on the science festival um website 
the National Museum of Scotland has also reopened. It's brilliant um, and is hosting uh, a really fascinating looking um, exhibition, Pale Blue Dot. That's Edinburgh Science Festival's um, uh, exhibition there. And that's on until the 11th of July. So if you can go do, uh, it's free to attend, but obviously you have to pre-book um, your museum entry. Um, after this, I think the museum's got to be in touch with you uh, with a really short survey. And these surveys are really useful because they allow the museum to kind of hone the kinds of things that we do in future um, and, and really make sure they kind of land, I suppose. So if you do have the time, that's always a really great way you can support um, the museum's work. There's also a really good newsletter there. Um, thank you to obviously our speakers. Thank you again, guys. Um, also, thanks to the behind the scenes uh, team, um, Simon Malone and Lee McCulley, who've just been unbelievably professional and uh, do a great job. So well done to you guys. And finally, on behalf of National Museum Scotland, um, you know, thanks to those of you who made a donation with your um, tickets tonight. That really means a lot. And if you didn't make a donation, there is another opportunity. Uh, I think there is details in a moment of uh, how to do that, to, to give your donation, support some of the fantastic work we've been hearing about tonight. So on that note, thank you again once more to our speakers. Uh, have a lovely evening and enjoy the rest of the Edinburgh Science Festival. Bye. Bye.